smarter than us maybe smarter than both of us combined which may not be saying much yeah set the bar pretty uh, high there joe <laughs> for, for you for you anyway <laughs> but uh, you know amanda is is talking about a number of different things in this podcast coming up amanda and i started at the same time back in 2012 and i'm really looking forward to listening to it because honestly i don't know that much about her history but every time a new broker connects with her, talks with her, they get kind of blown away with her experience. Um, Walker, as we all know, wrote a best-selling book, and we like to make fun of him and, and, and prod him on, and we're proud of him for it as well, called Buy, Then Build. And in this episode, Amanda's doing the opposite. She's talking about the benefits of, of, of building a business, outsourcing some of the things that uh, people don't like to do themselves, and then actually selling them off, kind of the opposite of what Walker talked about. Yeah. So um, Amanda, you, I mean, you're right. She's kind of the, a, a more private person. And I think I was working with her for uh, three or four years before I realized that she was, or I even learned that she was featured in Time Magazine when she was in her young 20s for some of the entrepreneurial work that she was doing. And she actually had a documentary filmed on her about sourcing pearls from China, um, of wow. all things. Yeah, I know, I right? I didn't know that. <laughs> there you go. You've been working with her for seven years and you didn't know that there was a full documentary on this person that we've been, uh, we've been working with. Uh, and also that she was uh, invited and actually spoke at a conference. Did you know this, Joe? She actually spoke at a conference in the past. She, she did? I know, right? I absolutely no idea. We're, we're, not, we're underutilizing her talents. There's no question about it. That's what I'm saying. She is actually crazy smart. One of the most talented entrepreneurs that I know. Uh, and have known. So in this conversation, uh, we ended up just talking a lot about her background because I, I wanted to find out, you know, just in this conversation, what wisdom would come out, you know, what uh, revelation would come out uh, of this. And again, a couple of things right away, you know, finding out how did she uh, start multiple, multiple businesses, grow them, but not work herself to death because She's always building a new house or a new rental property. She's always got some other uh, project with a, a business on the side. And then she's been working with us uh, for as long as she has. So her time management skills are great. So we talked about this idea of how do you outsource your business to people. And I know we've covered this before on past podcasts, but I don't know if this topic really gets old because people are doing this in different ways. And every time I talk to somebody about this, I learn something new about how they're doing it. And, and so I asked her, uh, what is the first thing that you uh, outsource when you start a business? And I'm not gonna share the answer now because it, it actually surprised me a little bit uh, as to what the first thing was and what the last thing was that, that she does. Uh, and then we talked about this idea of, is it better to actually build a business or is it better to acquire a business? And when should you look at uh, both options? Uh, and, and I thought it was a pretty good conversation, a very honest conversation as well that, hey, there's room to actually start a business uh, in this entrepreneurial world of ours where people might think we only want to talk about buying a business. Uh, she made a pretty good case for when it makes sense to actually start something from scratch. So fun conversation, honestly, and um, really just lots of interesting tidbits of information throughout the, the entire podcast. Well, I think it goes to the the depth and breadth of the quality of the people that you've hired at Quiet Light over the years. So I'm looking forward to listening to it. Let's uh, let's go on so people can stop hearing us chatter. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say one more thing. Joe, did you know that she decided to start an affiliate business and within four months became the number one super affiliate for that product? Uh, you know, I had no idea because the only one who I thought was ever a super affiliate was... Jason, because, you know, he wrote The Bathroom of Millionaire. <laughs> he's, our, he's our other author. <laughs> he's our other author, our super affiliate. Um, wow. No, I didn't, I didn't know that. She's never said a word. I exactly. love it. Exactly. I love it. So anyways, uh, let's uh, get to know Amanda a little bit and hear some of her past and some of the things that she has to say about online business. Let's go to it. <laughs> Amanda, thank you so much for finally agreeing to come on the podcast. I've been trying to get you on the podcast for a while, but I know you've been building houses, building rental properties, 
doing business, you know, starting businesses and of course, uh, helping Quiet Light Brokerage uh, clients as well. Yes, I've been busy, that's for sure. Yes, for sure. So now I have some downtime and uh, decided to take on the challenge of uh, doing one of these podcasts. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, of course, doing the podcast is always a little bit uh, interesting, but uh, I think, uh, again, we're just going to have a conversation here about um, your background and everything else. So I, I, I tell something, I don't, I don't want to uh, embarrass you right off the bat here, but when I talk about the Quiet Light Brokerage team to, to people, I often say, well, you know, Joe is a client, you know, Jason is the one that kind of forces way in the door of Quiet Light, you know, and I try to scare him away by giving him all these awful leads, you know, and, and next thing I know, Jason's breaking every record in the book. Joe came on and uh, has been doing the same. But when I, I talk about you, I said, I always say one of the smartest buyers I've ever worked with. And that's how you and I initially met. You were looking at one of my transactions uh, that I had, one of, a deal I had. Do you remember that deal? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. So, and there was a lot of competition for that deal. Um, but uh, of all the buyers, you were able to kind of hone in on some of the key metrics right away, uh, which was super impressive. I, I deal with a lot of buyers. So, uh, super, super impressive. So let's, let's do this. Let's go back a little bit to how you got started in the online world because you actually started with a, a website called purepearls.com. You were featured in Time Magazine at a super young age and then you filmed a full documentary in China as well, right? Yes, I, it's kind of crazy to think about it because that part of my life was much of the whirlwind, but um, I was actually in grad school when I started my pearl company and uh, thought it would make a great hobby, something as a creative outlet outside of the day-to-day, -day, um, you know, just what I was doing already in grad school. And so um, it kind of just snowballed and I just loved it. I was super passionate about learning um, the business, not just the pearl business, but just e-commerce, internet marketing, what it would take to get in front of um, customers. And that opened up so many other opportunities um, from public relations to search engine optimization. At the time, uh, those were, you know, big channels for marketing. Um, and you know, it just kind of went from there. At the time I was focused on the pro company, I realized there's much broader markets and um, I started getting interested in other opportunities as well. Um, I was invited to a conference in DC to do a speaking uh, engagement for Yannick Silver's mastermind group. And um, as much as I do not like public speaking, um, I decided to face my fears and do it. Um, and I met so many awesome people there and I just kind of uh, basically looked at what everybody was doing and thought, wow, there's just so many things that we can be doing with this internet space. Um, and that was kind of a long time ago. So I'm thinking that was probably around 15 years ago. Um, so at, at that point, I just started um, another company and built that company, sold the Pearl company um, because it was exploding at the time and I just, I couldn't manage it all. So um, I kind of started small with my new company in the printing industry, so it was check printing, um, and I started uh, five new websites. So I just kept building, building, building. Um, and developed relationships with manufacturers um, and started printing basically our own custom products and uh, scaled that uh, up and um, realized that I could develop a team to make sure that it was a lifestyle company and I didn't have to be in the business. Um, and that's kind of where I got the idea of starting lifestyle companies. Businesses that I didn't have to work in, that I could work on, um, building teams to run them, and um, basically allowing me to do a lot of different things. Um, so I didn't have to focus on just one niche 
and uh, I, I'm just just trying know. to run being being in the business. I've met a guy yeah. over the weekend. I was at a conference in Los Angeles, um, not in the internet marketing world. It was just kind of a, a more generic business conference. And um, yeah, he was, he used to be a professional fighter. And then uh, we were talking about his business career and he said, well, I have 13 companies. I founded 12 and acquired one. I'm like, oh my goodness. And he said, well, I don't really do that much. I, I put teams in place. And We've talked about this on the uh, on the podcast as well. We had Shaquille Praza on uh, twice talking about this uh, and how he hires CEOs and puts people in place. And this seems to be kind of this this uh, recurring theme with a lot of what we're doing here, uh, talking uh, about that. What, what at what point did you learn to put people in place with your companies? What what did it take um, for you to be like, you know what? I'm going to hire people. Was it? Did you have kind of like a uh, a moment where it, it, it kind of struck you or was it more organic over time that uh, th that uh, you realized that this is a good way to go? I'd say both, a combination. Um, with my Pearl company, uh, I realized I needed to put systems in place because I wanted to do a lot of different things. Um, and so I also, I was, um, I went to an event and I heard somebody speaking about uh, outsourcing or things that you didn't like to do. And I was like, well, that's really smart. <laughs> because when you run a business, there are going to be things you don't like to do. There are those dreaded tasks that you put off and put off and put off, right? But you need to do them to run a functional business. Um, and so at that point, I started outsourcing things for the Pearl Company. Um, at, when I first started, obviously, I was wearing all the hats in the company. Um, but then I started hiring a customer service person. Um, I was lucky enough to have somebody to handle all of the manufacturing and the shipping for me, the packaging, um, so I didn't have to actually even touch the product. Um, and uh, from there, you know, I hired a marketing team, content writing, um, and things like that. So basically, all I did was make sure that the marketing was on point, um, develop new ideas um, for marketing channels, and, you know, keeping the books in line. Um, and then when I brought on my new company, my uh, check printing and financial printing company, um, I kind of used those same systems uh, and developed it for that business. And it worked really well. Um, I started that from the very beginning. And so it was very much an absentee owner business outside of me looking at new, new marketing channels and um, keeping the books and whatnot. Um, and so I was able to replicate that with each of my other businesses as well. Um, I think it comes out of a necessity um, because when you want to do a lot of things, you realize you, you have to create these systems, right? Um, but also, I don't think you can be really good at everything, um, and I'm not. And so you hire people that are really good at each individual um, component. So somebody with customer service is likely not to be the greatest at bookkeeping, right? And um, somebody great at search engine optimization not, may not be the great at Facebook marketing. Um, and so I think it's really important to hire somebody that is um, be really in tune with each different component of the business. It just makes more sense. Okay, so we're going completely off script here because we were going to talk about uh, buying versus building and kind of building off of uh, Walker's episode that we filmed. You know, Walker, who yes. is a, we always have to say now, best-selling author, Walker uh, Dybel, uh, because he's done such a great job with his book, Buy Them, Build. People are like, we were, at a, we were at Capcom this past weekend and we gave away his book and when people realized he was there, like, oh, oh, the author's here? Oh, that's super cool. And I'm like, <laughs> It's kind of a big deal. Um, but uh, so we'll, we'll get to this. I do want to talk about uh, building versus buying and, and making sort of the argument of uh, why would you want to build a business someday? Uh, but I want to go back to something you're talking about here, uh, hiring out different pieces. Okay? It's, it sounds so easy to do to say, um, you know, hire a marketer and hire somebody who's really good at what they're doing. Okay, great. Uh, look, I've hired people before. I've fired people before in these roles, usually in the agency sort of roles. When you're looking for somebody to hire specifically for marketing, let's let's delve into that. 
Um, how do you a qualify them or what do you look for? Are you looking for an agency? Are you looking for an individual that works for you directly or does it really matter to you? And then also, how do you, you said keep, keep the marketing message on point. How, uh, what are you doing to keep that marketing message on point and to check that? Uh, that's a great question. I was actually reading something last night that said, um, you know, there's, there's no such thing as a getting rich quick theme. Um, it often takes a lot of work to get there. Even though it sounds simple, it's actually really difficult. Um, it it kind of goes with the same thing that, you know, success is like an iceberg, right? You only see the, the top part, but there's a huge component at the bottom to making that work. And so there's a lot of trial and error um, with that to find the right person. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of hiring and letting go and finding somebody else because you learn what you don't want. Um, you learn what you actually need. Um, and sometimes that can be an agency if they have all those components built in. So if they have um, everybody you're looking for and they're doing exactly what they say they're going to do um, and holding themselves accountable, then great. Then that makes sense. And um, to me, that's ideal because there's less hand-holding and less training involved. Um, a lot of times, though, it does involve finding one contractor to do something very specific, and it does require constant uh, monitoring to make sure that they're staying on task and um, basically meeting those milestones that you've uh, put in, uh, in place for them. So I think that you know, building that team does come with trial and error. It does come with, uh, you know, some uh, unfortunate firing of, of team members um, because they're not uh, performing. But at the end of the day, um, finding those quality team members are, are what's going to drive your business. So it's really important to stay on top of it. Yeah, and I think it's important as well when, when talking about letting people go. Like this, this is the unfortunate part of, of uh, being an entrepreneur. Sometimes you have to let people go. Uh, but I, mm -hmm. I do think it's important to look at the options available to you as well. Maybe like you said, somebody's really better suited for customer service uh, and you can really apply that. Um, I often think about like sports teams and what do they do, right? Sports teams are often handcuffed by who they actually have. Uh, on their teams. And so a lot of times they play to the strengths of the team members that they currently have. Uh, and so this is something that, that for those of you that, that are you know, like me, kind of cringe at the idea of letting people go, um, this is something that you can do is invest in the people that you do have uh, and find out where they do thrive. It doesn't mean that you should just needlessly hold on to, to somebody. Um, you know, everybody is an adult and should understand that, that obviously it has to be a good fit, but you can definitely invest in, in people as well. Um, how involved do you get with that marketing message when you, when you uh, are taking a look? Let's say that you hire somebody to do some Facebook marketing for you and they're going to set up the creatives and everything else. How closely are you monitoring uh, their, their uh, ad work and um, how much are you kind of saying, okay, I'm going to let you run and possibly fall, you know, and, and this is your, your gig. Uh, I guess my, my question is how do you avoid micromanaging versus letting them run wild with a completely wrong message? <laughs> well, that's a good question because I think it, first of all, I am natural manager um, and anybody in my family will tell you that. Uh, so especially when it has to do with your marketing dollars and getting a return on investment. However, um, there are things that I just don't know how to do um, really well. And for example, Facebook marketing or um, even like Amazon PPC or something of that nature. And a lot of times um, you will be told that they need a ramp up period so they can, you know, kind of test campaigns, see what's working, um, and then uh, dial in on um, more targeted marketing after they do broader match terms. Um, and so they do require a period of time to really get those conversions up or in Amazon's case, a cost. Um, down. And so um, with that, I, I really only check in every three months to see if they're meeting our goals, you know, um, and if they're not, then, you know, you have to decide, okay, am I going to give them another three month period or do I need to um, move on? And so I think it really depends on what it is, what channel. 
obviously uh, with SEO, there's a really long period of time that you kind of have to wait to see if it's working. And that can be really hard for people who are not um, patient enough because uh, with Google, um, you know, with all of the algorithms that have come through in the last couple of years, uh, it can take a lot longer than it did previously, before that, uh, in the old school days, to get results. So it just really depends, whether it be Instagram, uh, Facebook, where I think you can see a lot quicker results uh, versus Amazon or Google PPC, um, and SEO is just a completely different ballgame. Are you, are you an old enough internet marketer, and I don't want to call you old, but uh, are, are you old school enough to remember the Google dance? Yes, am I showing my age now? <laughs> Absolutely. So glad that we got that recorded that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here calling you old publicly to everybody. Uh, no, I just, you know, it, I, I often, uh, I love talking to entrepreneurs that have been doing this for a while, right? Because... Um, we remember the, the Google dance, right? Every 30 days or 45 days. And then the forums would light up like, all right, the Google dance is happening. And you'd want to see where you, everything shook out. Uh, and did you gain, yeah. did you lose? Uh, how, how'd that go? Worse than the stock market. I tell you, it's <laughs> uh, uh, unbelievable. Yes. Um, I don't miss that. Uh, you know, there's a lot more opportunity for diversification now, it seems. So yeah, yeah. Don't and I rely. Think I think Google's done a good job of, because if, if you got uh, edged out by like a spammy uh, site or somebody that was just manipulating the search results, you're, you're done. Right. I mean, you had to wait 30 days minimum to be able to correct it. And it was just, uh, it was torture, uh, but exciting at the same time. Um, all right, let's get to the topic that we were going to talk about. I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about building versus buying. And I know, you know, I brought this up with Chuck at Capcom. He's like, why would you guys talk about this? You're going to shoot yourself in the foot, right? Because we obviously make our money uh, when people buy businesses from yeah. us. But there's an argument to be made as well, especially for creatives for building something. So let's start right there and, and just ask, you've done both. You've bought businesses and you've built businesses. Mm -hmm. um, where do you fall kind of on that spectrum and why? Well, I'm more on the builder side. Um, I'm just a natural builder, natural creator. I love the challenge of it. I love actually creating something from nothing. That is very much who I am. Um, and you can't buy something without having somebody build it, right? Um, so there is the other side of that coin. And so somebody has to build a business, um, hopefully a great business for a buyer to want to invest in. Um, and so I I love talking about building businesses because that's really where I, I'm passionate, uh, you know, about, um, I'm also very analytical, as you know, um, with, you know, data and statistics and, and marketing. And so um, I just, uh, I think that when you're looking at buying a business versus building, I think there's um, great opportunity for both, right? If you're, if you have a portfolio of businesses, um, for example, like Shaquille does, um, and obviously, you know, he's wanting to buy businesses because he doesn't want to invest the time to necessarily or take the time to grow because they have a team ready to jump into something um, and, and run with it. Um, whereas I like to take some time to, to build it, see kind of where it's going to go um, and, and then run with it that way more organically. Um, and that's kind of where my passion lies. Um, and I like to kind of have that control of what I'm, um, the product, how it's being made, uh, packaged, the overall message around it. Um, and, and that goes with pretty much you know, everything, whether I'm building a home or a business. So um, and, and it's kind of my thoughts on it yeah and on that i mean you've, you've built multiple properties uh, uh physical like uh mm -hmm. I believe since you've been with quiet light one rental property two homes that i at least that i know of um uh yes three three so oh, uh -huh. wow holy cow and i know like uh, you're really involved in the design process as well when, when we met down in austin you had uh, floor samples and everything like that in the car because you were going through all that so you do like to get into that do you think it makes more sense? Let's just talk 
purely investment strategy here from just an investment standpoint. So I'm looking to place money into something and, and really kind of grow from a financial standpoint. Um, do you think that there's a benefit in buying versus building in, in that scenario? You know, today it is harder. It's more competitive to build. There's no doubt about it. It's much harder than when I started out. Um, when I built um, my pro company, it was in 2003. We launched in 2004. Obviously, that was a total different time. Um, kind of similar with my check manufacturing company. Um, and then, uh, you know, with Amazon, I still think that there's uh, some easy room for building, obviously. Um, and uh, even with like Facebook marketing, um, you know, you can see some pretty quick uh, growth there. Um, but there is something to be said for businesses that have really paved the way and are established and the foundation is there. Um, and so I think it just depends on how, you know, you want to invest. And so do you want to invest in something that's established, um, that has a history, the foundation, it's already been done, they've already built a team for you, um, and you're just walking right into it? Um, that makes for a very sound um, and smart decision uh, versus taking the risk and, and just, you know, seeing where it takes you and building a business. Because, I mean, the honest truth is I've built a lot of businesses that haven't been successful either, you know, and because either burnout or um, the marketing just didn't pan out. But I've learned from those. And so um, I think one of my greatest successes uh, is built off of just learning from the failures um, and then building off of that platform. Um, so. I think there's something to be said for both. Um, from an investment standpoint though, I'd say if you're looking to invest in something, investing in a business that's established makes more sense. Um, so I guess it, it's just different. I am a creator and a builder, um, but at the same time, I do like to invest in sound uh, vehicles. So I've done both. I, I've, I've asked this question of a few people before. Um, if you were to guess how many domains you own <laughs> right now, <laughs> how many would it be? Oh gosh, I don't know. And I, I'd hate to look because I'm sure I'm spending a lot of money just wasting away. Yeah. So, um, yes. I actually purchased domains for my daughters as well because, you know, I don't know where this internet space is going. And so I just want them to have opportunity. Um, when the time is right. So yes, I have a lot of wasted domain. Yeah, I, I log right into now. My, yeah, I, I log into my my domain account, and it's it's kind of like going down memory lane of bad business ideas, <laughs> or maybe yes, isn't it? They're, they're not always bad, but some of them are bad. Like some of them are like, oh my gosh, what was what was my diet bad when I did, <laughs> decided to do this? because this is the very someday bad. businesses, yes. <laughs> What I might do someday. Well, exactly. You know, there's a couple in there. I'm like, you know what? I actually still want to do that. It's just a matter of a. It doesn't pay any money if I do it, and and b. You know, right. the time. Um, but I think you before that you you were actually getting on to a point that I thought was really interesting. And I found this with buyers. You've been with Quiet Light now seven years. I think. Yeah, seven going on. I think eight. Wow. Crazy. I know, right? So you've dealt with a lot of buyers over the years as well. And I find that uh, buyers tend to be tinkerers a lot, right? The people that love to buy and do really well, they're great at taking something existing, tinkering, modifying it, improving it. Um, but a lot of, of buyers, and this is, this is speaking generally, this isn't the rule for everybody, that the creative process of starting up something from scratch and having to, to create and have that runway isn't really of interest uh, to them. You know, those are mm -hmm. things that kind of bore them. And I know in Walker's book, he talks about this. He starts out saying that he had started companies and they, they, they failed, uh, including companies that received quite a bit of funding. And that process, that ramp up period was really painful. But once he started buying, he really enjoyed that part of it. That was super exciting to him. So I think some of it does come to just personality. You know, what- yeah. What do you get excited about? You are a creator. You're a creative person. Um, you love design. You love uh, you, you love creating systems, and you are data driven and data oriented. So that makes sense that you are going to really go towards that, that starting 
uh, side to help exercise some of those creative muscles. Um, what are some of the first areas that when you're starting a business, you like to outsource? Um, obviously the website design, um, that would be the first step. Um, and it, it, I mean, really it depends on what the business is, but, um, the first step would be uh, product manufacturing, uh, website design, um, and uh, how to start your, your first layer of marketing. And I would outsource all of that. And basically, I would just be um, managing that process to make it look and feel like I want it to. So um, the business imparts the message um, that I want to you know, in integrate into the business. But that part is the hardest part, I think, of running a business. Um, it does require a lot of thought, creativity, and management. Um, at the same time, for me, that's really what drives me when I'm creating something. Um, that push and that challenge is what I look forward to every day or stay up super late at night thinking about. Um, and so um, I think it, it really is important to start outsourcing from the beginning because um, I'm obviously not a manufacturer, not a web designer, um, and I don't do the the day-to-day -day marketing per se. I hire all of that out. Yeah, and I've heard that a lot. You know, start start at the beginning. Don't don't try and uh, run and bootstrap and then think that you're going to be easy. It's going to be easy just to hand that off because it's really hard as an entrepreneur right. to do that. What's the last thing that you would outsource? Um, probably bookkeeping. To be honest, yeah. because uh, uh, yeah, it, it pains me to say this um, because I want everybody to have clean books, right? So, um, but the last thing for me is bookkeeping because I I know how to get a bank account, a credit card. Uh, you know, that's easy. Those are things that most people can do, super generic. Um, but running your books, um, you actually need to have a history. Uh, at least a couple of months um, and so it's pretty easy to integrate that into um, QuickBooks or, or whatnot from your bank statement so typically that's the last thing I would hire out because it seems to me that um, it doesn't take them very long to catch up. That's interesting so I'm actually reverse on that like I, I, I like to outsource books first because I just don't enjoy it at all, you know, and right. is what, you know, like you said, outsource the stuff that you don't enjoy and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, keep the things that you do. So cool. Well, this has been, uh, interesting. It's been uh, useful. Uh, it's not everything that we plan to talk about, but I actually liked what we talked about. I thought that there was something interesting. So I'm going to end with this. You, you've been advising buyers and sellers for a long time now. And most of the people that listen to the podcast are, are looking to buy. There are some people selling, um, if you were to give one piece of advice for people buying uh, an online business, whether it be through Quiet Light Brokerage or through any other uh, place uh, you find it online or another brokerage firm, um, what would be just kind of the one thing that you would uh, advise people on? Um, I think the best thing that you can do is take some time to research just the overall broad marketplace. Don't just look at a few packages. Really allow yourself several months at least to get a good feel of what's a good fit for you. Um, there are so many different models of businesses from fast businesses to Amazon to e-commerce um, and so forth. And so uh, one may seem more attractive to you. It may not necessarily need to be a certain uh, niche, but it may just be this, um, a certain type of model um, that is attractive. And I just want to add to that. But the other thing that I recommend is don't um, basically pigeonhole yourself into a certain niche um, because you might find a business that doesn't have an attractive product, but everything else could be right, right? The lifestyle component, the workload, the margins, the net profitability. Um, and so I think that's really important to keep an open mind. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks, Amanda, for uh, coming on the podcast. Uh, I really do appreciate you uh, uh, coming on, and I'm sure everybody else will as well. Uh, everybody knows where to reach you, Amanda at Quiet Light Brokerage. If you have questions about 
buying, about starting, about, uh, you know, just have really generally uh, questions about this. Um, I will stand by the fact that your, your entrepreneurial background speaks for itself. Uh, and um, I think the success that you've had repeatedly speaks for itself. So I uh, appreciate you sharing some of uh, the, the, the wisdom you've gained over the years um, uh, doing this uh, entrepreneurial uh, thing that we do <laughs> uh, yeah. and uh, everything else. So hopefully we can have you on again sometime in the future, but we'll wait a year or so before we do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please do. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Have a great day.